Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Diana Hernandez. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Sociomedical Sciences, uh, and I'm really honored uh, to be part of this uh, 400 years of inequality uh, event uh, to kind of mark the importance and significance of many of the issues that we study uh, as it relates to uh, inequalities and disparities, but that have really uh, strong and um, rooted uh, legacy in, in slavery um, and other forms of inequality. I have the pleasure of introducing my fellow panelists um, and uh, our moderator for today. Uh, so Peggy Shepard, as many of you know, is the executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice. Uh, it's a membership-based grassroots nonprofit that she founded exactly 31 years ago um, in West Harlem, <laughs> deserving of applause. She has a long history uh, of uh, successfully combining grassroots organizing, environmental advocacy, uh, and environmental health community-based participatory research uh, to advance environmental policy and the perspective of uh, environmental justice in urban communities, ensuring that all uh, have access to clean, healthy, and sustainable environments to enjoy. And so we owe a lot of uh, environmental policy here in New York City and around uh, the U.S. and even thinking about environmental justice to Peggy's leadership uh, early on. Uh, and Sonal Jessel uh, is, uh, is a Mailman alum. Uh, she just completed her MPH in Pop Fam. Uh, and she's also kind of our bridge person today because she now works at WE Act uh, as the policy and advocacy coordinator, uh, where she primarily works to advance the organization's policy agenda at the city level. Uh, much of her work revolves around promoting climate resilience uh, here in northern Manhattan. Um, and prior to uh, working at WE Act, uh, she was also a research assistant on my team uh, where we worked on energy health uh, and justice issues. And so with that, I'm going to introduce her and then she'll do her thing as our moderator. Hello, okay. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. This is a really exciting event to be a part of. Um, so for the past 20 years, WE ACT and Columbia Mailman School of Public Health have been working together to develop a better understanding of environmental health issues impacting communities in northern Manhattan, partnering on several studies and campaigns um, that have evolved into many policies that have been able to address different environmental justice issues um, in New York City and uh, around the state, as well as on the federal level. Um, these two brilliant people have been working together in partnership for many years on topics such as uh, energy efficiency, healthy housing, toxic beauty products, climate resiliency, and emergency preparedness in New York City. Um, we're here today because this marks the 400th, 400th anniversary since the first documented slave ship arrived in Jamestown. We're also here specifically because this is Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, which in my mind is a day of remembrance, support, discussion, advocacy, awareness um, of indigenous people that were here before uh, the colonization of America by Europeans in 1492. And we're also here to acknowledge the descendants of Native Americans as well as slaves for, that are still fighting for their land and their rights today. Um, so when I think about environmental justice and its principles, I believe that they're rooted in acknowledgement and excavation of our country's history of slavery and genocide um, because it's injustices in the past that have led to where we are today. Um, the principles of environmental justice, I'm gonna read just the preamble because I think it bridges that really well. Um, this, the principles of environmental justice were created in 1991 with the participation of Peggy from WE ACT um, and uh, the notion of the history of inequality is, is in here. Um, so we the people of color gather together to begin to build a national and international movement of all peoples of color to fight the destruction and taking of our lands and communities to hereby reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of our mother earth, to respect and celebrate each of our cultures, languages, and beliefs about the natural world, 
to ensure environmental justice, uh, to promote economic alternatives which would contribute to the development of environmentally safe livelihoods, and to secure a political, economic, and cultural liberation that has been denied for over 500 years of colonization and oppression, resulting in these poisoning of our communities, the land, and genocide of our peoples, do affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice. Um, so with that, <laughs> I want to just start off by asking a big overarching question for whoever wants to take this. Um, what is the connection between race and environmental justice? And what about health? And how do your experiences as women of color inform your work? Well, you know, it's, it's great that you started out with the preamble to the 17 principles of environmental justice, especially since this is Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, over a thousand people came together in 1991 to develop those principles, and Native Americans were a very important piece of that. And when you um, look at some of the other principles, it really talks strongly about the commitment to Mother Earth. And that, again, is, has really shown a very strong, um, a strong engagement by the indigenous community. So I just wanted to make that, that point. You know, back in uh, 1986, um, I met two people, Charles Lee and Bernice Miller Travis, who worked on the Toxic Waste and Race Study. And that was a study that was developed by the uh, United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. And it was the first study that really showed that the primary predictor of where a toxic waste facility is sited is a community of color, and secondarily, a low-income community. Over the years, there have been numerous studies that have confirmed, uh, confirmed that data, as well as looked at that data in individual states. So we certainly know that uh, that communities of low income and communities of color have been targeted for environmental racism by industrial polluters. They have targeted those communities because those communities uh, are less informed, less powerful. The elected officials um, have not taken up this issue and voting may not be as robust as in other communities. So over the years, we have really attempted working with communities of color and groups around this country to ensure that the environmental justice movement has the capacity it needs. Because again, we are up against, we are low income communities, communities of color, less power, less powerful, and we're up against very, very powerful interests, very powerful lobbyists, whether it's in Congress or whether it's here at the city council or uh, in New York state. You know, one of the reasons the plastic bag issue has taken so many years is because of the lobbying from, from industry. Um, but we have been successful in, in pressing, uh, pressing forward to get a ban on plastic bags, a phase out, and certainly a fee. Um, as a woman of color, just looking at the, the national environmental movement of, of large green groups around the country, I can still go to a policy meeting in New York City and be the only person of color in the room and one of the very few women in the room. And so we still uh, seem to see the fact that even though there are many women in uh, environmental groups around the country, the ones that I actually see uh, really developing and advancing policy uh, at the mayor's office or other places are often men. So again, um, it means having to be aggressive, being assertive um, as a person of color and as a woman to ensure that our voices are heard. So I'll answer the question slightly differently um, as a sociologist. Uh, so one of the kind of interesting things about today is that a lot of what we see today is actually, again, kind of rooted in a legacy of disadvantage. Uh, and, and a legacy of oppression. And so to some extent, what we see in our communities today are, is the same kind of pattern. So the siting of uh, industrial facilities and uh, the environmental burdens, the kind of cumulative uh, hardships happen to be in communities of color that are low income. And that because of these issues, the prices kind of stay low 
And it's only when they get better that all of a sudden they become available to other communities. So I work on uh, issues that are contemporaneous and their contemporaneous hardships in communities like the South Bronx where I grew up and where I live uh, that has had a strong and like long legacy uh, of environmental burden, some of which uh, Peggy uh, and company have worked to uh, not only ameliorate, uh, but also to just recognize, right? Recognition is the first step to justice. And until we actually call out some of these issues, it becomes really hard for the, for the policy solutions and other solutions to come, uh, to come from it. So um, as a woman of color uh, that does work on uh, energy, health, and justice, uh, housing as well, uh, I feel like I tell my students this all the time, we're all biographically situated. And I think Regine, uh, so Dean Diacqua has been really uh, kind of talking about, and this, you know, 400 years uh, of inequality is really about socially situating oneself. And as I socially situate myself, I basically know that, I mean, but for grace, literally amazing grace that was sung today at the opening ceremony, I wouldn't be here. And, uh, you know, having been a, a student in public schools, um, having breathed uh, contaminated air for the better part of my life, I mean, for all, for all intents and purposes, the stats are kind of against me. And yet, the whole purpose behind uh, working on these issues is that for, for other kids, literally, that grow up in the neighborhood, not to have to face those same realities. And so part of it is to lift up that legacy, to lift up my social position, and at the same time, uh, be working alongside uh, folks like uh, Peggy uh, and other community groups to say, not only does your work matter for research, our collaboration can matter to kind of magnify uh, the importance of what we do collectively. Yeah, thank you. Um, so since this is a neighborhood conversation and it's supposed to be centered around community, um, I want to first ask Peggy, um, we act as a community-based organization um, and we talk a lot about a strategy for bringing up black and African American communities is to harness community power. Um, how has we act harnessed that power over the years and what do you think are strategies that have been successful? Yeah, well, in, in the beginning of our organization, we really began to translate environmental exposures as health impacts. And our first major campaign was getting the city to fix the North River Sewage Treatment Plant, which is in the Hudson River, uh, just downriver a bit between 138th and 145th Streets. I'm sure you all have passed it. Um, fortunately, it is not the way it used to be when it first went online back in 1988 where it was spewing odors and emissions um, at high, high levels, higher than the regulated uh, uh, amount. And so we began an eight-year organizing campaign to ensure that the city would fix the plant. And uh, to make a long story short, we began informing and educating the 100 people who came out every month for eight years. You know, you hear a lot about people of color don't care about these issues. That is not true. And in fact, if I look at the membership um, that we have, I would say that uh, more than half of our members who come out uh, every month are low-income folks. They are not the brownstoners uh, and the gentrifiers who you see moving into our community. They are the people who really do understand that air quality and water quality and other kinds of um, nuisances that are throughout our community really affect the quality of their lives. And so, you know, we began with education and information. We early on reached out to the Mailman School of Public Health for help uh, because at that time, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences had just developed um, a national meeting with scientists and environmental justice advocates. This took place in 1994, historic meeting that brought those groups together for the first time to really begin to talk about what would a research agenda look like that would begin to address environmental justice issues. And it certainly helped that the National Academy of Medicine, two years prior, had to developed a panel and report on recommendations of how to address 
environmental justice through research. So a year or two later, the Children's Environmental Health Center uh, began. We reached out to the P30 Center here. Uh, Joe Graziano was the director then, and we've worked with Regina Santala, uh, and now um, uh, Andre Baccarelli. So it's been a wonderful 21 or 22 years working with both of those centers. So community-based research became an important other method for us to begin to uh, address the issues. Certainly community organizing, um, engaging residents um, in ways that, so that they could really begin to be a base of support for the kind of policy change that we need in this country. And I should say, um, it was I guess 1998 or 99 that we began our environmental health leadership and justice training where we've trained hundreds of residents over the years. And when we first started, um, we really took the uh, basic environmental uh, health course here at Columbia, and we modeled our program on that course. Um, originally, it was uh, being taught by a lot of um, researchers and professors here at Columbia. And then over the years, we have evolved it to be a much more uh, popular education method and um, our staff uh, are able to, um, to really um, develop and administer those modules and engage residents uh, in those uh, issues. But we first, we, we understood that it's not enough to do the community organizing, that it is city, state, and federal policies that affect the quality of life and the sustainability of our communities. And so if we are not engaged in developing and advancing policy that we can't make real change. So those are some of the methods and approaches we have used. That's great, and that brings me to my following question, which was gonna be about, you know, we act as a lot of policy and advocacy work. Um, why do you think it's important to include communities on that and do research with them beforehand and, and gather their voices, voices for policy versus what a lot of people do, which is they just, you know, look in from the outside and determine what should be done and then and enforce those. So what do you think is more powerful about including communities from the bottom up? Well, first of all, communities have expertise. Um, it may not be a PhD expertise, although some do have those, um, but they do have a lived experience of being in that community, understanding some of the environmental insult and understanding the choices um, and and also um, the way city services um, either do or do not impact uh, the community. So that kind of experience and the political lived experience becomes very important when you're developing a clinical trial or you're developing a survey or some particular kind of research to really understand um, even how to administer an appropriate survey. What is really going to, um, to be effective and what kinds of questions uh, do you really need to ask? So I think engaging residents is very important. Um, one reason we don't have a lot of policy change around some of the issues that we think are important is because we have not created a base of support for those. Uh, now that no longer people are reading a newspaper, they're you know, clicking and self-identifying the kind of information that they're going to read every day, we really realize that it's very important to identify and target the audiences for very specific kinds of information because they're not getting it in kind of a, a, a more general way. So we believe that um, it's very important to create that base of support to ensure that those folks can go to their elected officials and in an articulate way articulate their story and the problems that they're experiencing and just to give you a very quick example, um, back in, I guess, about 2002, uh, we uh, joined a coalition of green groups that was started by NYPIRG, and they were developing a lead poisoning uh, rule. And they weren't getting too far because, you know, we had a city council um, where the head of the housing committee, um, you know, got all of his contributions from landlords. So lead poisoning prevention wasn't going anyway, anywhere. So um, really having uh, term limits made a huge difference. Term limits makes a real difference because it 
cleared out a lot of those people who had been there 20 and 30 years. It brought in new people, it brought in women, it brought in people of color and people who thought differently. But we really began to make a difference with this coalition when we said to them, and, and you know, they weren't too happy with this, we said, we've got to bring in parents of lead poisoned children. We've got to bring in parents who may be at risk because those parents are the ones to go talk to the elected officials, not you know, white professionals who are sitting downtown in a green group. Um, you know, my, my city council person, Bill Perkins, um, he doesn't want to hear from them alone. He wants to hear from people in his district to know that they really think this is an important issue. And so when we began to organize residents to go into the city council to tell their story to their electeds, whether they were in Queens or the Bronx or wherever, it really began to make a difference. And in 2004, we were able to pass the, uh, the strongest lead poisoning law in the city. And I think parents and grassroots folks helped make that happen. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask both of you, uh, born and raised in New York City, uh, what do you think has changed over the years in your neighborhoods? Uh, where do you think there are issues that are cropping up and how, do you, how does that uh, tie into environmental justice issues? in the area? Um, so I think the person that figures out how gentrification is an environmental justice issue and lays it out conceptually will have a, a whole bunch of citations to begin with, right? And I think that that's actually, I mean, it's, it's the conundrum of uh, the green land uses, for example. So when communities are improved, uh, this whole idea that that it isn't for the natives, right? That there's some other imagined consumer and it's not people that, for whom those street intersections or street addresses uh, have been so uh, so compromising for health and for well-being and for life chances. Uh, so when I think about uh, New York City in general, um, I see it kind of changing uh, and in, in ways that aren't necessarily accommodating of everyone uh, but instead uh, is accommodating for people who have a wealth, who have capital, uh, who have access to capital, who have access to uh, financing, uh, credit, et cetera. Uh, and that to me is kind of, uh, is, is troubling because at the same time, I live uh, in an area that has a deep concentration of not just public housing, but shelters. So people that are living in kind of transient housing and what that ultimately means uh, more recently, I've been doing um, some work, and I guess this is top of mind, uh, around opioids uh, and the kind of issue around the, uh, a legacy of uh, like the opioid uh, when it was heroin and it wasn't the kind of national crisis that it is now and the kind of attention that it's getting, but that it's always had uh, in the air bridge between Puerto Rico and uh, a place like the South Bronx or in Harlem. Uh, so these are some of the things that are kind of coming up that are not just environmental per se, uh, but are, you know, it's where the kind of built environment and the kind of social conditions of everyday life kind of come to a head. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, makes it challenging. I have to say, though, that um, Riverbank State Park um, was kind of, and then that's, I mean, this is a nod to uh, WE Act and to uh, the amazing uh, work that they've done over the years. And when I was a kid, I remember taking the, the bus 19 uh, down to the Riverbank State Park and what it meant uh, for us, right? It meant a green space, it meant a clean space, uh, it meant a place where we could uh, recreate and we could do so safely in a place that was new. It didn't feel then uh, like a lot of the projects feel now. That park felt like it was meant for us. Like we could travel from the Bronx uh, to the edge of Harlem and it meant like it, these were changes that were about our improvement and uh, about our benefit. Some of the changes that happen now, waterfront, et cetera, oftentimes mean uh, development in different ways uh, that is intentionally uh, or unintentionally uh, exclusionary uh, and doesn't necessarily feel like uh, it's for the benefit of people that have been in the communities uh, long haul, for the long haul. Yeah, I would certainly say that um, 
there are new issues that have evolved, but the old issues continue. Clean air. Um, we still have issues. I think Ricky Pereira Center has has looked at uh, the clean heat program. It's looked at the fact that the MTA has um, has basically transformed every single bus in the system to hybrid electric, and still the air quality is not what it should be. In fact, I should say the reason the MTA has uh, transformed every bus came about because of the partnership between the Children's Center and We Act um, because of the, um, the backpack monitoring um, of pregnant women, understanding the impact of diesel on, on the mother, the fetus, and the, uh, you know, the developing child. We are able to use that data in basically an 18-year campaign. Um, where we also filed a Title VI civil rights complaint against the MTA. Um, we were able to use all of that data to finally get them and the governor to purchase natural gas buses and then to transform the entire fleet. But clean air continues to be an issue. Um, but certainly um, 20 years ago, we weren't talking about food justice and food security. Um, we weren't talking as much about climate resilience and climate change issues. Energy really wasn't uh, an issue on the table for you know, everyday discussion. Um, energy security, which um, I think Diana has uh, really raised the visibility of that issue here in New York City, and WE ACT has been um, very happy to carry that message forward. Um, looking at the issue of urban heat, um, Again, all of these uh, have been very important. And we continue around indoor air quality because even though we might have, you know, that's been an issue for, for decades, um, it still is not an issue that is resolved. We still have uh, folks in public housing and in rental housing uh, not being able to control whether it's pests or other kinds of indoor allergens that are also now coming from a variety of consumer products, which is why we have a, a new campaign and a, again, another evolving issue, looking at the issue of chemicals and, and toxins and phthalates in consumer products, whether it's makeup, hair products, and other kinds of uh, consumer products that all of us here today are using every single day. And a shout out to what happened last week. The governor signed a new law where they have to disclose chemicals and menstrual products that we act had a hand in making happen. So that was really exciting. Just shout out. <laughs> um, so I want to ask a few questions about energy, energy and security. Before I do so, we will define what that means. And I will take a crack at it. And you could add to it. <laughs> uh, so energy and security is defined as the inability to meet household energy needs. Um, it's very similar to the way we think about food insecurity in which there are multiple dimensions to it, uh, physical, economic, behavioral dimensions. Um, and there it's very, the existence of it is very related to uh, socioeconomic status, um, other social disadvantages, negative health outcomes, and um, is related to other economic and environmental disadvantages. Um, so, Diana, I want to ask you, in your work in energy and security, housing, health, um, have you been noticing new issues cropping up due to climate change? And um, if so, uh, how can community-based participatory research kind of help address those issues? Uh, so, first of all, to me, uh, a nod to Sonal, and uh, to, to, it's, it's not necessarily about one person defining a thing, it's about it resonating with other people. Um, and so I just wanna like acknowledge that at this point, uh, California uh, just had a massive um, power, uh, planned power outage. So what does that mean? That means that the utility companies have decided to preemptively uh, turn the uh, lights off, essentially, uh, in order to, um, to, to reduce the risk uh, that wildfires would otherwise create. Uh, there, there was another kind of preemptive strike that they could have taken, which was to actually maintain the lines uh, so that people could have access to life-sustaining energy. So we use 
uh, energy for uh, all of the basics of life from lighting to refrigeration, heating, cooling, um, you name it, we need it. Uh, and it's such an invisible good that so many of us take it for granted. Uh, and the reality for some people is that they're challenged by meeting those financial obligations uh, on a regular basis. And it's the very people that uh, are challenged by this uh, regularly that also um, get shut off, uh, right? So uh, the Department uh, of Energy uh, basically has measured the national prevalence of energy insecurity and said it's 37 million. So one in three households are now considered to be energy insecure. That's two and a half times the number of people that are food insecure, and yet this, this uh, issue doesn't get as much attention. Uh, and I think part of the realities of climate change is that it makes us confront it. If it's the wildfires, which are all about uh, not only rising temperatures, but drought, and the California context really raises that, uh, it, it is also about the, the kind of hurricane and the impacts of natural disasters. If it's Harvey, Irma, uh, Maria in Puerto Rico, for instance, uh, uh, power outages, whether or not you were rich or poor, were your reality for an extended period of time on the island. And so it's not just that energy insecurity operates in and of itself, it also intersects with these other issues, right? So there's the eat or eat dilemma. So people who are uh, already uh, challenged financially have to make decisions between meeting their basic needs. They have to make decisions between putting food on the table or paying their Con Edison bills. And there's something uh, not only uh, horrifying about that reality, but there's also something uh, equally challenging about the fact that we have very few options. And I like to say, like, not even I can afford Whole Foods on a regular basis as the primary and sole uh, purveyor of the food supply in my home, uh, but I know that I have alternatives. But with utilities, that's not true. So usually you have one service provider, one set rate, and while that is equal, it does not necessarily uh, tr uh, translate into equity. Uh, and so climate change, I think there's, there's this other piece to this, which is about the new realities that can unfold as a result, and energy is not um, outside of that. I, I think, in fact, it's like at the forefront at this point when we're talking about community solar, when we're talking about access to renewables in communities, when we're talking about microgrids uh, and people having access and control and ownership of, the, of energy. Like, these are all examples that come from the crisis that is climate, uh, and how uh, energy is often uh, the, um, the, the one place where you see it first and that there is kind of a more ubiquitous, besides property damage, uh, impact uh, across populations. And it's also the place where we have to now revisit like whether or not large conglomerates like uh, you know, PG&E, for instance, that has a statewide hold uh, on utilities is the right way to go, or if we need more localized solutions. And WE ACT has been working on access to community solar and uh, leveraging, uh, you know, kind of policy to, to do this. So these are kind of all uh, potential areas uh, that climate change kind of helps to elucidate. Yeah, and I, I would also say that um, a few years back, we. Uh, organized about 400 community residents throughout uh, East West Central Harlem and Washington Heights Inwood to develop a Northern Manhattan climate action agenda. And I was, I must say, I was surprised that the number one priority that the community identified was energy security. And as a result, we have um, taken on doing um, solar installations to keep housing affordable. I mean, the best way to keep housing affordable is to bring down energy costs. And so when we see um, some of our small buildings, um, landlords that are you know, small landlords, they may not be making a significant profit from those buildings. The best way those buildings will be affordable as well as tenant co-ops is to reduce that cost. And so we are organizing HDFCs, which are tenant-owned co-ops, um, to, to get solar. We're also training community residents on solar installation so that they can be part of that solution in their own neighborhoods. And so again, um, 
people are very concerned about community shared solar, so we're looking um, at that issue. Um, people um, are concerned about microgrids. They really want to have independence from a Con Edison or PG and E. Uh, we remember the last time there was a blackout. Even laboratories here at Columbia were impacted and specimens um, were lost. Um, this is a, you know, Washington Heights Inwood has a very dense business, small business community, and they had huge losses when the electricity was out for a couple of days, lost food and refrigeration and all of those kinds of issues. So, you know, when you look at it, it shouldn't be surprising that energy would be high on the list of, of community residents. Great, and um, I wanna ask about, you know, the uh, community-based organization and academic institution partnership, which you've all talked a little bit about, um, but how does Columbia, as an anchor institution, um, you know, what, what does that mean for their status as an anchor institution when it comes to sort of community-based work, and, and what are the expectations of a partnership between a place like Columbia and we act <laughs> for both of you. So when I think about good neighbors, like my own good neighbors, I think of people that are paying attention to whether or not I'm around, right? Like if I haven't parked my car in a little bit, my, my neighbor Sarah will be like, hey, I haven't seen you around, you know, whatever. So, so part of it is about kind of just paying attention and realizing that we are kind of coexisting and uh, in the same vicinity. Uh, I think the other part is to then be responsive because my best neighbors are the ones that I invite over. Right, and the ones that I have over and that I share with, that I share my time with, that I share my resources with, that I might cook for. That doesn't happen happen often, but you know, you get the point, right? It's like you're you're kind of um, sh sharing uh, in space and time uh, in resources, and I think that good neighbors, so good community. Uh, academic partnerships are about sharing in kind, right? It's about saying, I know how to do certain things and I respect and value what you do. Is there any way that we can actually come together and do something that's better because we are working together? Uh, and so I have to give credit to um, people that actually have come long before me uh, for establishing uh, the relationship with WE Act and with other community-based organizations. But part of it is about welcoming our doors and also realizing that we exist in communities and that those and, and that Washington Heights, for instance, where we are now, or that Harlem uh, and. Uh, and that Harlem, I'm just going to uh, stop there, um, are, are also part of our kind of immediate surroundings and being responsible of, of folks in, in, at our institution is about acknowledging uh, the needs and also uh, opening the doors and being in partnership. Um, part of it through research and then uh, part of it through like I was really touched by having uh, students uh, come here and I was speaking to uh, uh, Dennis Mitchell. Um, and uh, mentioning the fact that like it's amazing for those students to be here because we really want to demystify whether or not this is a college option for them. As a lot of times, you know, in our communities, that's not necessarily the case. Like I wouldn't have planned 30 years ago that I would be uh, here today. So I think that that's uh, a part of it. You know, an anchor institution is also about saying like, you're welcome here, there's a place for you. We'll set aside some of those places, et cetera. Yeah, I do think that community academic partnerships are, are very important. Um, they've been important to WEAC's work. Um, it has provided an evidence base for all of our campaigns. I believe that we have invigorated and improved the research that's uh, been going on uh, with our two research partnerships over the past 20 some years. I would also say that um, Columbia School of Public Health is, is a very different um, uh, vehicle than the downtown campus, for instance. So at the same time that we've had um, excellent benefits by, by working with the School of Public Health, we had to be one of the um, chief leaders of the community benefits agreement with Columbia moving into the Manhattanville campus. So we spent six years working to organize community residents to be able to um, 
to testify at the ULARP hearings, to testify uh, around the environmental impact statement. We were able to develop partnerships with Fordham Law School to help us do that. To, uh, we had an open house every week so that community residents could come to us and help structure their testimony. Environmental impact statements are very complex and um, people are used to community residents coming and being emotional and yelling and screaming. We needed to um, really work with residents so that they were very much identifying key issues within the impact statement and speaking very specifically to those issues. And we were able to do that. We were also able to convince Columbia to do underground um, deliveries, uh, to use um, back then um, diesel uh, traps, uh, because uh, primarily, you know, when this all started about, I don't know, seven or eight years or 10 years ago at this point, um, diesel traps were, were just coming into use. So we were able to um, really get Columbia to think more about sustainability to the degree that Columbia won a neighborhood sustainability award from, from LEADS, which is the Leadership in Environmental and Energy Development. So I, I would say that to be a true anchor institution, um, a university like Columbia should be, for instance, um, back when there were school districts, school district five, which was central Harlem, was the lowest um, achieving school in, one of the lowest achieving schools in Manhattan and in New York City. With Columbia and Teachers, uh, teachers uh, College right down the street. I mean, that's outrageous. Why wasn't Columbia adopting some of the Harlem schools? Because it has that expertise and it would have been good for the students who needed that kind of field work. Um, anchor institutions do things like when they're doing construction, they hire people in the community. Um, when they're buying supplies, they look at minority and, and women, um, you know, business enterprises to do that. So there is now a lot of research and new books coming out about how anchor institutions can work. The National Academy of Medicine um, has been doing a number of symposiums around this issue and convening people to think about, um, especially groups like uh, Kaiser Permanente is probably um, one of the poster childs for, uh, for really doing this well. And I don't think Columbia has really begun to think about these issues and really needs to think about being a strong anchor institution uh, given the communities in which it's, it's living and working. Great, thank you. Um, so we need to kick it off to some questions and answers from the audience. Uh, before we do that, I just wanna quickly hear from you all in 10 seconds or less, what gives you hope in your work? Well, I think a lot of things give me hope. Um, we know that young people have uh, organized themselves to, um, to really speak out and think about climate change and what it means for their future. I think that's a very, very important um, you know, occurrence. We have not seen young people um, really organized since the Vietnam War uh, and uh, around uh, environmental issues back in the 70s. So I think that's a very important, um, you know, uh, very important occurrence. Um, the fact that community members, given a little, just a little bit of support, um, are raring to go on citizen science, on doing air monitoring uh, in their communities, on in being uh, engaged, that continues to give me hope. The problem is that there aren't enough resources to do community organizing, and most um, foundations and donors aren't looking to support that. They're looking to support policy change, not understanding that you've got to create a, a strong base of, of people who are supporting uh, real policy change. So looking at members who are, are really excited about these issues, um, and some of them you're beginning to work with Sonal, so you may have some ideas on that issue as well. Um, I remember um, 
um, a, one of my consultants said to me, gee, I went to one of your membership meetings and somebody asked what's greenhouse gases. And I mean, I wouldn't even know what to, to say. How do you work with that? And I thought, well, how long ago was it that you knew what a greenhouse gas was? I mean, you know, we all didn't know at some point and we read something or we found out. Well, these folks are, are, are at that level too and it doesn't take too long for them to get the idea and to understand the issue and they already understand air pollutants. Um, it's not too hard for them to understand what a greenhouse gas is. And so that's, that's really our work to ensure that people at all levels in this country understand these issues because these issues are going to have a huge impact on, on their future and the future uh, of new generations to come. So I, I am very hopeful. Um, we just need to have, you know, these issues are very, very political. And you don't make a lot of headway if you don't have the right political opportunity and window. And so we have to be prepared. So right now we haven't had that. The last two years we've seen amazing rollbacks in really important uh, regulations that really impact our health. So when we get back in power, we're going to have to roll back those rollbacks, but then we have an opportunity. And that's what we need to be thinking about now. What do we need to do? What are the policies we need to pursue? Because we're going to have that opportunity very, very soon. I'll say that, uh, and I'll keep this one brief, but I, I, not only working with students gives me hope and like kind of the imagination of what's possible, not just what is. Uh, and I feel like uh, that has always sat with uh, not just kind of a new generation, but also people who have been challenged by need. Um, you know, like necessity is the mother of all invention. My mother, you know, always used to tell me. And so that to me, uh, is about you know people that have been historically marginalized deciding and and occupying their power uh, and understanding their power and leveraging it in new and exciting ways and that to me uh, is is really hopeful. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all? Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, Thank you to, I know Dean Freed isn't here right now, but um, to the Dean and the Dean's office for putting on this really important day of events. I know that um, I was really pleased to be asked to, to speak, and I'm really, really excited to have uh, Jarrell Daniels here with us, who I'll tell you more about um, in a bit. Uh, but what we're gonna do is just have a, a brief opening comments from both of us. And we're really hoping to have this as a conversation <laughs> so that you all will ask questions, bring up topics, um, experiences, insights um, uh, for this really important issue. So uh, I think it's really appropriate that uh, in our commemoration of 400 years since the first slaves arrived here in the US that we talk about mass incarceration as uh, so many people have made direct connections uh, between slavery and current day incarceration. Um, I, and as I was like thinking about, well, what do I wanna say um, about this topic? Cause there is so much that can be said. I first went back to um, a film that I'm sure many of you, a documentary I should say that I'm sure many of you have um, watched 13th. Um, and if you haven't, you definitely should. Uh, and I was, you know, thinking about 13th and then the 13th Amendment, and I just wanted to go back and make sure that I remembered what the 13th Amendment actually says. And so I just wanted to read that um, to you all. It's really quick. <laughs> Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So basically, um, Slavery was abolished except for criminals. Uh, and of course that amendment holds today. So as I said, I, I was watching 13th <clears throat> and you know, the director Ava du DuVernay makes very explicit clear links uh, between slavery and mass incarceration and, and shed light, sheds lights on how both historically and contemporarily the carceral system really has focused on criminalizing being black 
and exploiting the loophole of the 13th Amendment, and there is obviously that big loophole there. So just, I mean, some quick statistics, many of which I know people who work in this area uh, are very well aware of, uh, but I think that also sort of can help uh, sort of solidify this connection or help us see this connection. 40% of inmates uh, are black uh, here in the United States. You all know that we incarcerate more people per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, I think we're followed by Rwanda and Russia um, and El Salvador. Um, but we are number one. Uh, there's been work done here uh, at Columbia and other institutions on million dollar blocks. I'm sure many of you have heard of those as well. So these are blocks where the state spends a million dollars or more uh, to incarcerate individuals in one census block. Uh, and those exist primarily in black and brown poor communities. Uh, there was some really great work showing this uh, in uh, these neighborhoods, these million dollar blocks. Uh, within uh, parts of central Brooklyn uh, where you see lots of, again, uh, uh, people who are black and brown and who um, are poor. Um, you know, there's a lot of history between slavery and our current mass incarceration crisis, but there are a couple of events that in the recent past, I think, really highlight uh, how we got to where we are today in 2019. So. The war on drugs in the 80s, um, combined with the crime bill of the 90s, uh, really had a profound impact on incarceration, particularly in communities of color. Um, a little fact that you may not have known is in 1992, the, during his first stint as Attorney General, William Barr wrote a report called The Case for More Incarceration, in which he put out the false idea that if you incarcerated more people, you'll see crime rates go down, and of course, that is not at all the case. So we're at a place now where, uh, according to the Sentencing Project, uh, for kids born in 2001, black boys will, one out of three of them will end up experiencing incarceration at some point in their life. So we are in this very, very treacherous part of our history uh, in the US that really does warrant us making these connections between one of the worst things that have happened in our history to our present day crisis, which is turning into one of those worst things again. So, you know, we're in public health, I'm in public health. I think of the work that we do here uh, as important to addressing the consequences of incarceration, but also ways to prevent incarceration from occurring. Um, and that's very much the public health model. And so we've heard of these different pipelines, or the, many of us have heard of the school to prison pipeline as, a, as, a, as a, a point for intervention, a point where we need to really uh, change that pipeline. But there's also the trauma to uh, prison pipeline, the drugs to prison pipeline, the mental health to prison pipeline. And many of us, whether we work in incarceration directly, we're doing work in public health in those areas, and those areas are important to addressing this incarceration epidemic. Um, I have uh, been working on, uh, with our dean actually, uh, uh, an idea of how we can address incarceration um, from the public health uh, standpoint. And many of you have probably heard of primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. And so we sort of applied that. We're not the first, uh, there's definitely been other uh, researchers who've looked at incarceration through this lens, but thinking about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So I just want to uh, talk about or bring up a few ideas about where we can uh, intervene at these various levels. So tertiary prevention is more treatment. Um, so this is what do you do post-release? How can we manage and mitigate the consequences of incarceration post-release? So thing like, things like removing uh, barriers to employment. Um, here in, in, in New York City, we've had banned the box, but obviously many jurisdictions do not. Uh, and I will even say programs that aggressively aim to employ people who have been formally incarcerated are incredibly important. Overturning laws that uh, limit access to safety net and social welf welfare programs um, like, like uh, food stamps. 
um, which many states still give you a lifetime ban if you've ever been convicted of a felony. Uh, connecting individuals to insurance through the Affordable Care Act, um, thinking about things like death penalty reform. Secondary prevention, here we're talking about what can we do while people are incarcerated and to facilitate the reentry process. So implement reentry programs, they can be incredibly useful. Uh, offer employment and educational opportunities during incarceration. We do a lot of work in this school, Bob Fully Love, others um, have done a lot of education. Uh, Geraldine Downey, who Jarrell works with. Um, those kind of programs are incredibly important. I would also say pay a fair wage to incarcerated individuals because some folks work, but they make less than a minimum, minimum wage. Um, things like uh, disseminating mental health and substance use programs within prisons and jails, uh, not just waiting for those issues to reemerge once people are uh, uh, re-entering or released. Reducing debt accumula accumulation while people are incarcerated. Um, and there's other ideas that I'm sure you all could, could uh, come up with as well. For primary prevention, this is of course uh, re mitigating any opportunities or chances that a person could become incarcerated. These are the, the more challenging, thorny areas that are hard for us. Um, you know, these are the more upstream uh, uh, topics and, and ideas that require a lot of forward thinking, a lot of critical and creative thinking. But changing developmental trajectories, um, reducing poverty, reducing uh, structural violence uh, and trauma, these are not easy things to do, but they are certainly within the realm of public health and they will impact um, greatly what uh, we can do in terms of prevention. Promoting access to substance use and prevention, uh, substance use prevention and treatment is, is obviously critical. Um, thinking about diversion programs, thinking about restorative justice programs instead of punitive programs. Working with judges and prosecutors, again, I know this is something Jarrell does a lot of, to educate them on different programs and the consequences uh, of the sentences that sometimes they are pushing for or uh, actually administer. Uh, so another really big area for me and I'm sure for many in the room is, is uh, lobbying for gun control policies as sometimes futile as that seems to be with our uh, Congress and administration. It's still incredibly important. So. Um, public health has a lot of different roles to play uh, when it comes to addressing mass incarceration. Um, and I hope that we can see more of the synergies coming uh, from having different people from different facets of public health addressing this issue. I wanna just uh, close with one of um, the things I also think we have to do to address this issue. And this is a pub within public health, but this is also more broadly just as a as society, um, and that's acknowledging slavery and its lasting impacts. Um, we are rewriting history uh, and sometimes not even acknowledging history, and now we're also revisiting the past in certain ways, it, it seems. So, you know, thinking about Michelle Obama talking about slaves building the White House and the pushback that she got uh, across the board, um, but obviously from more conservative, uh, Folks, with Bill O'Reilly saying, slaves that worked at the White House were well-fed and had decent lodgings provided by the government. I mean, are you effing kidding me? Like, that's absolutely absurd, and it disrespects um, a horrible experience that reverberates um, throughout society. Uh, we have controversies over Confederate memorials and flags. Why? Uh, we have streets and buildings named after people who advocated for slavery potentially were involved in lynchings or turned a blind eye to those. Um, that's honoring um, people that deserve dishonor. Um, we have an openly racist president and there is a huge rise in white supremacism in our country. So we are starting to revisit the past. Um, I had made comments uh, at our 50th, our SMS 50th anniversary, 
And so any of the people that were there are going to hear this. Again, I really encourage everyone to listen to an episode of, um, of uh, On the Media. It's a show that NPR uh, plays every week. And last year, they did a show titled The Worst Thing We've Ever Done. And it really highlights um, the way that we have not acknowledged as a society slavery and its reverberating impacts. And it compares our society to other societies, like, for example, Germany, which uh, perhaps you know isn't perfect in how it's acknowledged, but it's done in a much different way. And uh, uh, it's just an eye-opening and provocative uh, podcast that really does um, highlight what uh, we've done and what we haven't done to address this in our in our country. It also highlights a. Um, uh, a memorial that I would like to go to in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. I'm sure many of you all have heard of it, uh, where they have these monuments uh, representing the 800 different counties where we've known that there have been lynchings. And they actually have made two of the monuments, one for the museum and one for each county to come and pick up and put in a place that will be widely visible and acknowledge that the names on that plaque um, were, were people that were lynched in their, in their community. So I'm gonna just end this with a quote from Ava DuVernay. She was talking about um, her, her film, but also this idea of like our, our lack of acknowledgement around um, slavery. It might help us, I'm sorry, it might help all of us once in a while to get outside the United States itself like to go to South Africa or Germany because inherent in the very cultural fabric there, you have a sense of the past and a reckoning with it, saying this happened and we will bear witness and we will learn from it and we will speak on it and say that it happened and we will remember it. And we don't do that here, so we can't even have a real conversation about it because we have not been taught to talk to each other and we have not been taught to remember. So I think that that's one area that we also have to be um, proactive uh, is acknowledging what happened and not turning a blind eye and not letting us go back to that place, which it does sometimes seem like we are uh, heading uh, toward. So uh, I want to introduce Jarrell Daniels, um, who I'll turn, well, he has his own mic, but I'll uh, metaphorically turn the mic over to him. Um, he is an advocate for criminal justice reform. He's engaged in a variety of public speaking, research, and mentorship efforts. Um, he is currently a student at the Columbia University School of General Studies, and he is working full-time. I just learned full-time, I mean, that's a, a lot, um, at the Center for Justice at Columbia University, which is where I first met him. He was a 2018 Justice and Education Scholar. He was recently named an Open Society Foundation Soros Justice Fellow. Uh, and in that fellowship, he's launching the Justice Ambassadors Program, a leadership development program for justice system affected youth in New York City. He's working with a school of social work faculty on a virtual reality project titled Digital Arrest, which focuses on how social media can be used to build criminal profiles against youth vulnerable to incarceration. And among all those, uh, those things, he earlier this year gave a TED talk on what prosecutors and incarcerated people can learn from each other uh, I highly recommend that you watch it. It has already been viewed one and a half million times, which is highly impressive. Uh, and I'm really, really thrilled that uh, he's here to, to talk uh, and, and uh, answer your questions. So, Jarrell. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First, thank you, Patrick, for extending this opportunity for me to just share a few words with you all today. Um, just a general disclaimer. Um, as somebody who was formerly incarcerated, I just have to state for the record that I don't represent the voices of all people who have been through the system. There's approximately 70 million people who have a felony conviction in America, another 2.3 who are currently incarcerated, and then there also are the 6 million people who are on probation and parole. So those demographics of people are one perspective, one voice, one idea, um, and I, don't, I can't speak for all of those people. Their system has impacted them differently. Although the circumstances around our incarceration may be the same, it has affected them differently in their lives. So just a general disclaimer, anything that I say is open to be challenged by you all today, and I look forward to the conversation in the Q&A session. Um, Dr. Fulio, thank you for your honorable work that you've been doing for the years, and I'm happy to carry the torch. Um, if 
And again, just before I go into the topic of mass incarceration, I think it's important to just kind of backtrack and get to a real fundamental idea of where did the distinction between race differences come along or come into fruition. So I take you back to European countries when the idea was invented for indentured servitude. Um, and, and then you had white servants and you had black servants um, who created this undercast labor market, which was forced labor for the servants to pay off debt. Um, the distinction became where black servants um, under that system were more oppressed and faced more tyranny under this economic system in Europe. And that kind of migrated um, itself through the transatlantic slave trade um, and the, the Middle Passage, the Middle Passage is kind of brushed over lightly, but really this was the indoctrination process of where black people were dehumanized and, and categorized as a product for their material, material assets that they can contribute in physical labor. So I think that that's important before going really into the full concept of what mass incarceration is. And then the third point um, after, you know, indentured servitude, after um, the Middle Passage is the third point would be, I would say, the legalization of the criminalization of, of black identity uh, through laws and policies like the Jim Crow, the Black Code, so on and so forth in the 13th Amendment, which kind of put this stamp on uh, what was supposed to remove this type of treatment of black bodies. But as you can see, a result of it was later on um, what is still being in existence to today. So I think it's important for me to highlight those, those three factors, but also um, the fourth one is the role of academics and research inside of the, the policies that are being implemented in, in communities. So just to give you one concrete example, John Dilio, who was a professor at Princeton University during the 90s, um, he published a report um, that predicted a, a wave of super predators. And he said that a particular generation of young black men, not men, not men young black boys, excuse me, that he, they would grow up into adulthood and they would be the, the perpetrators of the most violent and vicious crimes in, in communities. Um, and and his, his report was so widely recognized that even black politicians, um, if you watch the third TV, black politicians were sold on the idea that they had to fight this wave of, of super predators that were coming into America. So I think that I just wanted to start off by setting that kind of tone and then kind of go into what led me into the work that I'm doing now today. So as um, Professor Wilson explained, I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, during the conclusion of my six year sentence, a pilot program was launched in Queensborough Correctional Facility, which is the only state prison in New York. Um, and eight prosecutors from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office entered the facility to work with eight of the incarcerated men. I happened to be one of the eight men. Um, and we sat side by side. It was a credit bearing seminar course. It was actually social factors and psychopathology that was kind of restructured to have a criminal justice take on it. Um, and at the conclusion of this course, um, we co-authored four policy proposals aimed at transforming practices within the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Now this is while I'm incarcerated. It's a phenomenal program, never in a million years that I think prosecutors would step inside of a prison to let alone work with the incarcerated population to develop a set of community resolutions. So it was, it was transformative, but the, my idea uh, behind the work that I'm doing on the outside is why are we waiting for people to have a felony conviction, be caught up in the criminal justice system before we give them an opportunity to create change. Um, and I thought it was important for me as somebody who went to prison at the age of 18 years old, um, coming home at 23 years old, I thought it was important for me to focus on a demographic of people who have the most frequent and reoccurring um, interactions with law enforcement, who are most likely to be stopped and frisked, most likely to be detained or prosecuted. And I know that's the age range between 14 and, excuse me, and 24 years of age. Um, so I thought, you know, it was important for me to kind of take this model of the program Inside Criminal Justice, which was the name of it, and kind of re put a re-spin on it. And what I was able to do from the connections I built in that program with the district attorney's office was to recruit um, city officials from different agencies. Um, and the goal for me recruiting them was to work for them to work with system impacted youth. Um, what I mean by system impacted meaning they've been arrested, detained, prosecuted, or spent time in juvenile or adult prisons, um, but all between the ages of 18 and 24 to work with um, city officials from these agencies over an eight week period in a seminar style collaborative educational experience for them to co-author policy proposals aimed at transforming multiple city agencies simultaneously. So um, how I was awarded the fellowship was to build out that initiative, um, how I gained access to a larger network of city officials was Open Societies Foundation, uh, where, where Dr. Fully Love attended, hosted a racial disparities and policing summit um, back in November. Um, and it was probably three of us out of all the heads of every New York City agency, all five elected district attorneys, the commissioner of Rikers Island, the police commissioner, um, was, there were only three people in the room who were supposed to represent the community and all three of us had a criminal background um, and only one person in the room um, who had the criminal background um, was, was, had a doctorate degree. Um, I, me at the time just had a general education diploma. I'm in, I'm in undergrad now trying to finish up. Um, so I, think, I thought it was important for, 
what was what was important about that experience for me was that I was the youngest person in the room, um, but I was also somebody who was supposed to represent the whole communities who have been impacted by the justice system. I just thought it wasn't wasn't fair. Um, but I, again, I appreciated the opportunity to be in there and share some of the ideas that I had. But I just think that you know we, we can't rely on one person to solve all of the problems for a whole millions of people. Um, and so the program that uh, kind of grew out of the Inside Criminal Justice course is called Ins uh, it's called Justice Ambassadors Youth Council. Um, and the Center for Justice at Columbia University was so great. Um, you know they were great in allowing me to host this organization at their foundation. Um, which is a campus-based organization, um, and what, what I was able to do in having um, the Columbia University resources was I was able to um, provide access to Columbia classroom for students who traditionally never thought of stepping foot on Columbia's campus, but also to give them an empowering experience of sitting side by side with um, people with leadership positions in their community. So though the conclusion was to develop these set of policy proposals, um, I think that the experience in itself for just having a conversation with an elected official in a classroom over a set number of weeks is something empowering for anybody in this world. I don't think that, you know, just for a simple system impact youth, I think for anybody in this world, pretty probably didn't have that kind of opportunity. So I thought that it was important, the experience in itself. So we graduated our first cycle of it. Um, six policy proposals came out of it. I can say one of them kind of informed the more recent um, Department of Education change, which was in June, June 25th, the mayor's office issued, issued a report uh, following the conclusion of our first cycle, saying that they were gonna implement restorative justice practices within all public schools, and to also ex uh, extend social emotional learning inside of the classroom and the curriculum to adapt that. And that was, kind of, that was one of the proposals recommended by the young people who worked uh, with the DOE representative in the first cycle. Um, so that's just kind of a concrete example of how um, the tool of collaborative education, working across differences to solve social problems, can lead to effective community resolutions. And that's kind of why what I'm most passionate about. Um, if any of you had the chance to, to t watch the TED Talk, you would have heard me say that I see myself in a future career in politics, specifically running for U.S. Senate, um, not particularly because I would like to have my whole life on public display, but really f uh, for the leadership position uh, to draft legislation that I know would include all communities perspectives. Um, what I, one thing I would like to bring back is the People's Assembly, uh, where legislation is being drafted by the community as a whole. Um, I don't think that I should just have a round table of people who have spent a large portion of their life in education systems and not in directly involved in the community. I don't think that they should be the only ones at a table discussing policy and legislation. So I think that, you know, that's what I would hope to use that role if I was to become an elected official. Um, but just kind of just to slow down, I know I said a lot. Uh, <laughs> But uh, hopefully during the Q&A section, um, if you just engage me with any kind of questions, uh, please don't be afraid to say anything. I'm not offended. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'm here to help you learn and also to learn from you as well. And as you saw when the professor was talking, I was taking notes because that's what students do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you for your time and, you know, I, those are my remarks. <laughs>